Welcome to the Chicago Bears Podcast. A presentation of ESPN Chicago, Chicago's home for sports. Here's your host, Pat, the designer. Bear Down Bears fans, welcome in to a Tuesday edition of the Chicago Bears podcast. Pat the Designer back at it again with Courtney Cronin as always. Courtney, what's going on? Not too much, just trying to enjoy a little bit of downtime before we get OTAs in full gear next week. And we actually get to see the entire team together for the first time in person. It's exciting. Yeah, you look. Are you, are you in a mansion right now? Is that where you vacation to? No, different that, mansions that, around the country. That's next year. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm I'm saving the money that I'm making for this show for the mansion <laughs> that I'm going to buy. That I'm actually going to have everybody from 1000 join me at. We're going to have a big party, big uh, cookout. So hopefully everybody uh, brings something, and I'm not left to cook for everybody. But we we, we got to do a creator uh, a creator house for the podcast where we all just stay in there like those old. Uh, 2005 MTV shows. Yeah, like Big Brother <laughs> or uh, Real World or what? I mean, what is it now? Love Island? Aren't they all in the same house? I'd just be worried about like who would be raiding the liquor cabinet at all hours. I mean, there's a lot of candidates, I think, among our hosts uh, at ESPN 1000, not naming names, Yurko, um, <laughs> that I would just be like worried, like, man, I just bought this bottle of bourbon. <laughs> Why is it like, you know, four fifths of the way gone, you know, 10 hours later? So, that, that's you know, true. but the next the next time we can all like, you know, pool our money together and get some sick beach house in yeah. uh, in Malibu or somewhere very warm, not Chicago. We will do that. Let's do it. We got to make that happen. We got a lot to talk about on today's episode. Quinn and Williams scrubbing the Twitter, which, of course, you know, like usually ends up leading to um, a contract on the team that you're scrubbing the Twitter for. But right. We got to talk about it because he fits a very good position that the Bears can go after. Should the Bears look to trade for Quinn and Williams? We're also going to break down some of the differences and concerns that we might have with the three rookies who haven't signed, but we did sign uh, our first, our first number 10 overall pick Darnell, Wright, And then got to look at this Panthers schedule. Cause I'm not going to lie. I had the Panthers of a seven win team yet again. And then I looked at the schedule and I was like, Ooh, they might have a tough time finding seven wins. Will that work in the bears favor with the pick next season? And speaking of the Panthers, we got to talk about DJ Moore being added to this team. Where does he rank? among the wideouts in the NFL, and does he give the Bears the best chance to win? All that and more on today's episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Make sure you guys are liking the video, subscribing to the ESPN Chicago page. Let's get into the show, Courtney. First quarter. First quarter. So, Courtney, you are our resident national NFL representation on this show. You are the most plugged in person that we have probably outside of maybe McKee. Maybe McKee. McKee seems pretty plugged in. What's going on with Quinn and Williams? Because he seems like if he's not happy with the Jets, that's a no brainer for the Chicago Bears to try and pull possibly some draft capital to go after. Is it a no brainer? Because I, last I checked, this, the interior of the defensive line, Pat, is pretty much OK for right now. We don't know how Jervon Dexter and Zach Pickens, like what they're going to look like. But we do know there's bodies there. It's not just Justin Jones and Andrew Billings yeah. and a couple like, you know, pieces from last year that were just depth pieces. Some practice squad guys, some guys who never got any actual like real playing time. But there's. The numbers on the interior are not the problem. It's the edge rusher spot that still remains kind of up in the air. But of course, a name like Quinn and Williams, this is a strategy that like smart players do though. You scrub your, you scrub your Twitter, you scrub or you scrub your inst Instagram because you can archive those posts. They don't go yeah. away forever. It's not like, oh man, like I really got to make a decision here. Am I going to delete all of my jet stuff and never see it again? No, you hit the little like bookmark thing and then you yeah. hit that. And then that brings you to your, you know, interface on your phone. It's like archive, 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 archive. It's a way to get people's attention. Kyler Murray has done this. Stefan Diggs has done this. It's a way to, it's a way that honestly, like millennial players and Gen Z players, I'm not trying to make myself sound old because I fall into that millennial de demographic, but it's a, it's a strategy that I'm probably, I wouldn't be surprised if their agents are telling them, Hey, yeah. contract negotiations are moving along pretty slowly. This is one way to pick it up because there's always the question of, 
oh, is he really that unhappy here? Most times it has nothing to do with the player being unhappy. Most times it's a ploy to get the anti upped between the player, his representation in the front office. Now, Quinn and Williams is kind of this third domino to fall of all of these like defensive tackle extensions that we've seen this summer or excuse me, this spring. Um, Jeffrey Simmons got his first big deal for him in Tennessee. Uh, the Giants did Dexter Lawrence recently. And now the natural like next in line would be Quinn and Williams. So he's number three overall pick in 2019. He's had a terrific career to this point. I don't see how the Jets don't pay him. So like when I see stuff like this, and I'm thinking, hmm, trade value, you know, what's the trade value? Obviously, if he really wanted himself out of there and if they really wanted him out of air, out of there, they'd be able to command a nice haul for a player like that. Could could it happen? Like, you know, maybe, but I just feel like this is something that when you've heard Ryan Poles talk about making moves to try to bolster the defensive line. I know he was on a number of radio shows, including Black and Abdallah last Friday, I believe, yep. after the schedule was released and talked about, hey, we got are you guys gonna get any edge rushers and made it sound like it's an imminent move. We don't know when exactly, but it's something that will be addressed. But that's talking about the edge rusher position. On the interior of the defensive line, I just feel like that still leaves a pretty big void on the outside and that you'd be paying a premium for a position that certainly is important, certainly is important in this defense. But given the guys they just drafted, I don't know if it's the top priority. I really don't. It's, to me, I look at it as right again. We talk about that linchpin guy, that guy that that can come in the middle and wreak havoc. I I look at a guy that has an opportunity to make the rest of the team better. I, I look at our defensive side of the ball, and and I'm not even saying right like I expect Poles to go out and get his version of Khalil Mack, right? I I don't know if I expect it, but the thing that I that I look at with that Bears GMs have done in the past is they go out and they pay really big name players mm -hmm. and then they don't give them the key piece that impacts how that really big name player was so successful. So I think right. A Quinn and Williams on this team, I look at him being able to get pressure on the quarterback, making things a little bit easier for your guys on the edge because you're going to draw some double teams if you're Quinn and Williams, right? Sure. And now all of a sudden, Tremaine Edmonds is able to become that blue chip player that he was right now. All of a sudden you're looking at TJ Edwards as, oh, wow, a guy who, played with Quinton Williams. I already know how this guy operates. Now he's back to what he looked like. It improves Jack Sample. I think it just makes the back line of your defense so much better. And it's why I would take a long look at this before I just put it away. Now again, right at the end of the day, I don't think that Quinton Williams is leaving the Jets. I think that he's signing. But if the opportunity for him to leave is there, I would at least like Ryan Poles to kind of see what that price tag might look like. Of course. I mean, you have about 30, you know, just around $30 million in available salary cap space. Like you have the financial flexibility to make this happen. But again, if anything, this is the whole Chase Young argument, which I just need people to understand. Yeah. You know, people are like, oh, like oh, he didn't pick up his fifth year option. Like that means he's getting ready to get on the market. Like we're going to talk Chase Young here first and then I'm going to go back to Qu Quinn Williams. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to dispel the notion on this. Ron Rivera and the entire Washington Commanders team might be entering, very well could be entering a must win year. Look at what just happened with Matt Ishbia, the owner of the Phoenix Suns, and Monty Williams and why he's out of a job right now. Mm. They pulled off all of these strings to go execute that Kevin Durant trade, and then they underachieved. Now, was the roster really set up to withstand the loss of Michael Bridges and Cam Johnson? No, it wasn't. But because there was new ownership coming in, billionaires are going to billionaire. He wanted to win the way that he wants to win. And he wants to put his stamp on that roster. So, and, and stamp on all the decisions. So Monty Williams ended up being the fall guy when most people think, Hey, like this guy took him to a finals two years ago. They went to the playoffs, like three of the four years he was there. What's the deal? Yeah. Well, look at the Washington commander situation. That team, when the Josh Harris ownership group, um, when all of that goes through, they're going to be in must win territory. The Denver Broncos are very much in that. And I think that that's the reason that you saw Nathaniel Hackett get fired 15 games in the last season and why, you know, they're willing to pull off big move, a big move to go get Sean Payton because they just paid owner, new ownership signing off on the, and the quarterback deal with uh, Russell Wilson. All yeah. of those things like 
point to how this year is going to be so pivotal for the Washington commanders to win that they're not just going to give up on Chase Young before they know, hey, can this guy play football again to the way that he needs to coming off, you know, the serious knee injuries played like 12 games the last two years. He's former yeah. like top, one of the top uh, top first round picks in the 2020 draft. So there's the idea that, oh, man, that they declined his fifth year option. You know, teams should start trading for him, like, or at least start throwing in offers. You're not throwing in a first round pick if that's what it's going to take for a player who, you know, first off, the option deadline passed. So I think that that kind of, in my opinion, that kind of like shows like why it wasn't going to happen like before that May 2 deadline. And really, we'd have to wait until training camp for that to happen. This is not like Ryan Poles has two first round picks next year. He's not just going to like punt on one of them to get somebody who's not a sure thing. Yeah. And to, you know, if you need a quarterback, we've talked about this on the show before. If you need a quarterback next year, having that extra first round pick is great leverage to get there. I say this to bring back to Quinn and Williams. He's the nine, number three overall pick in the 2019 draft. Yeah. And so if it, if, the, if it's going to cost a first round pick, I don't see the bears doing it. I, and that's like where my first holdup would be. Because first off, we don't actually know if if they are looking to trade him. It's just that he got in his feelings and he like scrubbed his Instagram. I don't know. Maybe he's doing some spring cleaning. Who knows? But <laughs> you do call. I mean, every front office, everybody is there. Everybody is available for a price. They always are. So you yeah. do make that call. You do have to like check in on that. And of course, he would. And I'm not like saying like people are probably going to listen to this and be like, oh, well, like, you know, just because they have four pieces on the interior that they expect to be like very much in a rotation to figure out who's going to start, who's going to be the guys that come in on certain passing downs doesn't mean that that position's done. If you can get an instant sort of upgrade there at the three technique position, you certainly have to look into it. I just think the price is going to be, you know, pretty considerable. Now, would it shock me if they ended up doing it? No, because you've heard how Matt Eberflus talks about the three technique spot. He says it's yes. the engine that makes everything go. And if they can strike a deal there that would make them comfortable with what they're giving up to get him, then, then of course, you, you have to at least like have that conversation. But if it's going to take a future first, I just, like the one for next year, to only leave them with one, because they don't know how the Carolina season is going to go. They don't know where that first round pick is going to land in the order next year. I just think that you have to have some patience when you're pulling off these moves, because if it's a quick fix for right now, when you still know there's going to be holes on the team, you're going to, you might end up looking back at it in retrospect and say, mm, that's probably not the route that we wanted to go, but he's a very good player, a very talented player. And I'm sure a lot of teams have seen it the way we've seen it and looked at his Instagram and say, hmm, is he not happy there? Let's at least check in on this. And I would assume that the Bears did the same thing. What's the temperature? Is there any opportunity for him like not to report the training camp holdout situation? I mean, holdouts hold hold happen all the time. Like, I would yeah. not be surprised, um, you know, if he's got a contract resolution that has not been solved by the time OTAs like really get going next week. Then, yeah, I could absolutely see like a holdout situation. I've covered a lot of these. I mean, Daniil Hunter yeah. in 2021 ended up holding out for, you know, all of like a couple weeks of, of the offseason program before ending up, you know, getting that big deal that he ended up re reorchestrating, re restructuring his contract. So things like that happen. But I think given who his agent is, who's very, very good at her job, Nicole Lynn, I would imagine that something's going to get done sooner rather than later. But the Jets are interesting because they are so loaded on defense. And, and that brings up the Carl Lawson uh, conversation. Like, are the, is there going to be somebody there that's the odd man out? They're going to have to, after the Rodgers deal went through and knowing what his cap hit is going to do to their salary yeah. cap situation, is there going to be somebody that's on the way out potentially a post June one cut that the bears might then be able to look at. It's going to be such an interesting season with the post June one cuts this year, mm -hmm. because I mean, honestly, like you're, you're talking about teams. It, it shows how much talent is in the NFL now as well, but you're talking about like a lot of good players possibly coming on the market that you don't feel like, Oh, this guy's completely past his prime. There's no way you go out and sign these guys. Yeah. So, and I mean, that's like, I think that's why people are, you know, chomping at the bit right now, looking at, hey, that guy might be a cut, that guy might be a cut, and thinking yeah. that the Bears will probably address this. Like, <laughs> they're not going into the season with the defensive line as is. They can't. But right. 
doesn't mean that it has to be a Chase Young or a Quinn and Williams or anybody that's looking for big money. If they and the team would be looking for some like big compensation, if that's like that's not the only way to fix this thing, or at least to like plug the hole for now. But you brought up a great point about what the three technique, what those interior guys do for your linebackers. Like they eat up blocker, they you know they eat up like what they're doing. Yeah that takes responsibility off of Tremaine Edmonds and having somebody like in front of him, who's able to do their job up front to like stifle the run so that you don't have a free runner coming through you. Like that's a big deal. And so you, you need to make sure that those two spots are short up. So TJ Edwards and Tremaine Edmonds can do their jobs. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my only fear, right? Like I, 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 I have higher hopes probably for Javon Dexter than maybe some people who have looked at his tape with Yurko talking about him going from a two gap to a, uh, a penetration type mm-hmm. system. I, I, I think that that is going to really help him and he's going to be quicker off of the line. I, I've gotten that tweet so many times and look how slow he is off the line. It's like, well, look at his responsibilities in the defense, but there is still that concern of right. Like, We've seen this years and years and years where you pay this guy to do what he did in another place, but you don't give him the piece that helped him sure. be able to do that in another place. Khalil Mack was a different situation. He was just a monster. But, you know, it, it would it, it does help in situations like that, if especially with T.J. Edwards, Tremaine Edmonds, Jack Sanborn, Noah Sewell or uh yeah, Noah Sewell uh, mm-hmm. uh, coming in to this situation. I, I I do think like Yurko, if you don't have the help up front, these guys are going to be fighting for their lives trying to make tackles out here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's such an important part of the equation that you did sign all these linebackers. Again, like foreshadowing, there's still moves to be made up front because you don't yeah. you don't realistically make those sorts of moves and you know invest that much in one position. Where, and not and not expect to like do something to aid them because you can't put that certainly nobody in this day and age would 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 put like all of that on a line on off ball linebackers who you know have have some ability to rush the passer but that's not their pre- predominant role. No, 100%. The defensive side of the line is still a question. I do think the Bears will address it. Like you said, uh, uh, Ryan Poles talked about how some he's hoping that something will happen sooner than later, which all I heard was something's going to happen. All right, I can deal with that. Something's going to happen. Uh, let's head into the second quarter here, Courtney. We got a lot of good content coming your way. Let us know how you guys feel in the comments below on the YouTube side. Do you think the Bears should go after Quentin Williams? Second quarter. But on the offensive side of the line, and a little bit on the defensive too, I guess, Zach Pickens signed his deal, four-year deal with the Chicago Bears. Got some nice bonuses coming in there. Shout out to him. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then Darnell Wright also signing his deal. Good to see the Chicago Bears getting these rookies signed. But... There are still three rookies who remain unsigned. The one in Javon Dexter, Tyreek Stevens, and Roshan Johnson. Is there any concern around Hallis or around uh, uh, um, uh, the Bears uh, uh, front office guys that there might be a holdout situation, a Jaquan Brisker situation coming, or it just hasn't happened yet? I just, I think it's too early to tell. I mean, even with Jaquan Brisker, like with his rookie contract situation, like I know that was the last one to get done last year. Cause there were, there were some guarantees and language in it. That was just like a holdup that they had to iron out. I never worry about these things until you were to get to training camp where, you know, like with Roquan Smith back in 2018, when he had a holdout back then, because I believe it was language over, helmet contact like leading with your head that like there was stuff in there that could really like cost him um financially in terms of like the penalties and in the fines with that so like with the new cba that's gone through you just typically don't and that was in 2020 you don't see rookie holdouts the way that we did with the last cba and i don't anticipate that being an issue um we haven't even gotten to june yet like we haven't even gotten to like mandatory mini camp so I would imagine that the remaining three that you talked about will end up getting signed uh, within the next couple of weeks. Like there typically just isn't that sort of drama that we've had, you know, when the rookie wage scale was, was so out of control back before the 2011 CBA, where you had people doing this all the time. And 
I, you know, for guys too, especially someone like Ro- Roshan Johnson, who very well could be playing his way into a number one spot this year in that running back room. You want to get out there. You want to like be part of this. You want to start learning the offense, start learning the guys that you're going to be around. Like, I don't, I never like have it like rise to like DEFCON level one until like it really needs to. So I think this is just a matter of time before all three of them get signed. I mean, they had, you know, there, there's ever three more yesterday. Certainly it's good. It's always good. Like when you get your first round pick uh, yeah. under contract is his first round pick contract. Cause of course they're going to have the fifth year option on it. That's a four year fully guaranteed deal worth yeah. 20, like nearly $21 million. So of yeah. course you have to, and like with the way that cap structure works, you have to allocate and, and it changes based on like where you're drafting and like, you know, the Houston Texans with their two first round picks, they have a ton of money. They have to allocate for this draft class. The bears, you know, with, with double digit draft picks, not so much, but like they still have to like give a certain portion, like most times to sign a draft class, it's like under $10 million just for like that year with yeah. the salary cap. And of course it probably is a little bit more with the bears just because they did have a top 10 pick in uh, Darnell. Right. But I'm not concerned. I, I think that this is just stuff that until it becomes an issue, it's not. And it's just a matter of, Hey, it's the off season guys are getting back in for, you know, off season workouts and then OTAs pick up with everybody next week. I would imagine it's going to get done soon. Yeah. It, it's, Right. Shout out to him, man. And when I saw that contract, like maybe I just haven't seen a top 10 pick contract that I actually cared about in a while. Sure. I've been very irritated by many of them. But mm-hmm. 20 million with the 12 million dollar signing bonus. Shout out to you, my guy. 12 million in the bag. What's the first purchase you make? <laughs> oh, man. I mean, if, if I had that sort of if I had a signing bonus like that, I would the, invest. The Bears a- podcast is giving you a 12 million dollar signing. bonus. Well, I, I mean, I making? guess I have to buy the beach house that we're all going to vacation <laughs> at or at least put like down like a deposit for like a very expensive and bougie Airbnb. Yeah, um, I would. I would end up investing probably three fourths of it because the longer you can, you know, keep your money, I think is important. And then I'd probably probably buy a new car, probably buy, probably buy some of these purchases I've been putting off for a long time. And then of course, like buy the people around me, uh, things that I think that they could benefit from. Hey, I love it. I love it. I would love to know. I always love to know like what players buy though. That is really, you brought that up. Like when we get to talk to Darnell right next, I'm going to ask him like if I'm sure somebody else will too, like what is your first big purchase? There was a really cool story that we see happen all the time. But when I covered the Vikings in 2019, when they drafted Mike Hughes, uh, the cornerback who I think now has bounced around a bunch of places because he's had some really unfortunate neck injuries, but he bought his mom a house actually before he signed that contract. So speaking of kind of like bringing this full circle with the other three that haven't signed, Mike Hughes was going into training camp. Like he signed his contract like the couple days after like taking this picture saying, mom, like I bought you this house. Like I, you know, I don't ever want you to work again a day in your life. And I'm like, Hey, how did he do that? If you didn't, I mean, of course, you know that the money's coming, but do you have to put down a down payment? You have to like, you know, there's a lot as a homeowner that you have to do, but it was always a cool, it's always a cool story to see how players end up paying. A lot of times they pay back the people who help them the most on their way up and, and seeing, seeing guys give mom a house. Like I think is always, is always really cool. I'm I'm not going to lie. It's usually something for moms. Like when, when when everything breaks the right way, you got to get something for moms because moms usually been the one, right. When, when pops is the one in your ear sitting there screaming at you, telling you to make the tackle or, or, or pushing you to get to the next level. Mom is the one that's hugging you on the sideline. You know what I mean? I think it was Quentin Johnson, the receiver from TCU. I think he's the one who went to, he went to the chargers. So like way Mm -hmm. the chargers put out this video that like he gets the call from Tom Telesco. He's like, he's like not emotional at all. Like he's just kind of like processing it. And then he's like announcing like after he gets drafted, like he turns to his mom. He's like, all right, you need to put your two weeks notice in tomorrow. Like, I think stuff like that's really cool because you don't know how long your career is going to last in the NFL, but if you're a high enough draft pick, there's enough generational wealth right there that even if you don't make it, as long as you're smart and invest your money in a wise way and make sure that you have people around you that are taking care of your money, you can do those sorts of things where you don't have to, um, the things that you always wanted, you will be able to achieve financially now, which is always cool. But I always, 
I think it's the rookie symposium that those guys go through May, June. Um, that's like how they learn about like, you know, what how, you know, me, media training is one yeah. of those things. And of course, financial literacy is another one. I, I, I know someone who used to like be part of those, um, like training sessions with Minnesota. And I asked like, what do you teach these guys? Like, are they receptive to it? And you get some who like, you know, just don't care and are just kind of like they're going through the motions, but you get a lot, a lot of others who like, this is my job now. I'm not just, this is before the era of NIL. I'm not just playing to play and playing for my future. Like this is my future. And you've got to let the bears do the same thing. They've got people in there teaching them about, you know, the life skills that you now have to have balancing that with your finances and the contract that you just signed and knowing that like how much goes to your agent, how much goes to your union fees with the NFLPA, how much, how much you get back after taxes. A lot of times like those contracts and the, in the, in the dot in the bottom line that you get in your paycheck doesn't exactly look um, as lucrative as, as you might've thought. Of course, for a lot of guys, it's still life changing money, but it's um, sometimes it can be a real wake up call for guys when they see, Oh wait, I'm not coming home with a hundred million dollar paycheck. Like, no, <laughs> like that's tough. Yeah, it, it's a. Uh, it's like who was? I think Shaq. Shaq's got one of the best stories where he's like, he went to buy a car after getting his first big deal, and the guy told him, "You don't have enough money to buy this" because he didn't know who Shaq was. Sure. So he bought. So he bought two, <laughs> and then he bought his mom a house, bought his dad a car. And his his agent calls me. He's like, "Hey, hey, what are you doing? You 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 have no more money, <laughs> huh? What?" I thought, yeah, taxes, dog. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. It's, it's good to see. I, Actually, I, in a state like Illinois, I'm just telling you, we have we do hella high taxes here. How much is Darnell Wright actually getting? That's the real question there. Like, 12 yeah. million signing bonus. He's probably seeing And that's seven allocated. That? Yeah, because they can, they can give you – I mean, the reason that they do a signing bonus, they can, like, split that over the next couple of years of the salary cap. But, like, yeah. to find out how much he's actually taking home – in year one, yeah. um, living in a place. I mean, that's why, that's why guys want to play in Florida and they want to play in Vegas because no state income tax. Like, that's yeah. huge. So I, I, I doubt anybody when we were talking about the Jacksonville Jaguars and why the NFL hates them. Can you imagine going to play in, in London and with the taxes <laughs> over there and trying to get free agents to want to go there? I mean, it just blows my mind. The finances of these players, like, they're not as rich as you think they are. Yes, they still have generational wealth, but it's not – what what that what he signs that contract for? He's not taking all of that home with him. Yeah. Somebody called Uncle Sam who uh, wants to you know reckon with that a little bit. Yeah, that's okay. I, I'd like to be not as rich as I think I am in that in that <laughs> sense. You know what I mean? That's exactly. A, when we get when we get over a hundred million downloads, man, I'll take a hundred million dollars. Shout out to everybody out there. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna keep this. Thing. Actually, one more question before we get into halftime. I do want to ask this because this question popped in my head last night about. Uh, the Chicago Bears offensive line and how everything's kumbaya and we have all the pieces right now. What happened to all the beef with Tevin Jenkins and the coaching staff? Is that just gone? Is everybody kumbaya and happy around there? Because last season, it yeah. seemed like Flus couldn't wait to get Tevin Jenkins out of there. And now all of a sudden, right, Tevin Jenkins got the braids in. He's dropping memes every day on Twitter. He's one of the funniest people I've seen responding to tweets. And everything seems happy, go lucky. I think with Tevin and some of the conversations that I've had with him one-on-one -on -one in the locker room, like he's, he's a very cerebral person and he is not like what you think of, like, you know, offensive linemen, like, you know, no emotions, meathead must, you know, meet, yeah. see defender, get defender sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, like, yeah. Te Tevin was very honest and very open about, how he thought he wasn't going to be on the team. He was, he was talking to, I believe it was his fiance at the time. I don't know if they're married now, but like he was talking to her last August, like, Hey, we might, I might be out of here this week. Uh, they might look to trade me during the week of the, um, the roster cuts. And yeah. I, I think that you have somebody who you asked to make, you asked to make a big move last year from left tackle to right guard and with some right tackle in between, he kind of like bounced, bounced and then stuck at right tackle at right guard. Um, Cause they were trying him out all over the place and coupled with the back injury, like, you know, he had, he's had some small, like, you know, of course the back injury in 2021 that required the surgery and then, you know, changing his body, having to still deal with probably the, the residual pain of that. Like, He's been through a lot. And of course, when when players don't pan out or like they, it feels like there's some sort of like friction, 
you know, for whatever reason, fans always end up on a, on inside of the coaching staff and blaming the player and saying all this stuff and not realizing how difficult that is for somebody who probably thought he was going to have a career at one position and now has had to move not once but twice because he's going to be playing left guard this year. So that's the one thing I thought that was kind of interesting. And, and I know that, you know, the Bears did a really good job with their um, – with their schedule release video, like akin to the bear, the TV show, which they shot at Mr. Beef. Like I live right down the street from that place. And I was like, man, they were down here, like having like a Hollywood set (laughs) inside that restaurant. The wrestler whose name escapes me because I'm not really a big WWE person, but uh, do you know who I'm talking about? The person that they like, uh, why am I blanking out his name? I, I know exactly the guy with, like, who the you're really talking curly about. Hair, like uh, and Kevin tweeted like, man, you guys didn't tell me you were doing this. I think he felt left out from the, um, from the schedule release thing. And, and, and I don't know if that's any, if that's any sort of highlighting what's going on behind the scenes that they didn't ask him to be in it, but he definitely looked he definitely sounded kind of kind of salty that he wasn't a part of that. So yeah. does that shed a light into anything that's going on behind the scenes? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, for Tevin, this is going to be such a big year for him going into his third season because, you know, they'll soon find out, can he play left card? Can he stick on this offensive line? Or are they going to have more moving parts? Because right now it looks like everything's pretty much cemented in place. But if Jenkins doesn't look good at left guard, there's a chance that they end up moving Alex Leatherwood there. They could end up trying, you know, other, I mean, Larry Borum's still on this roster. Like, it, but I think at worst, Tevin Jenkins is your swing tackle. At best, he's your, your left guard, starting left guard. But he's probably feeling some pressure that, hey, you know, things haven't been rosy since my rookie year, since I got hurt and had the surgery and all this other stuff and haven't been able to, you know, really find my place anywhere on this offensive line. Now, now he has a chance to do that. But, it was tenuous and they were absolutely taking calls on him in, and I reported this back in uh, it was like early August and they're shopping him and you know, nothing panned out. And I think Tevin was such a happy accident for this bears team to be able to get really good play from him at right guard. I mean, it was Tevin Jenkins and Braxton Jones, the players you were talking about, man, those guys look like they're going to be the ones playing these spots next year. Of course, Nate Davis comes in, he's playing right guard, moving Tevin over to left guard, maybe being back on the, on the left side of the line will be good for him. So I, I don't think there's anything there right now. I mean, you can speculate, but I just think that this is, it's early in the off season. We haven't seen what he looks like with this offensive line. And next week will be really important to see what those first steps look like. Yeah, it, it's it's going to be huge for him. Seth Rollins, by the way, that was who I was trying to remember. Yes, I, I see. Uh, I, I like. I feel bad. Like I, like, I remember watching the video when they're like, you know, just wait on it, like schedule release, and this guy like screaming. I'm like, I texted somebody. I was like, oh, should I know who that is? Like, yeah, and I feel yeah. bad because I'm not. I'm not, I'm. Not, I know wrestling is like a huge thing. Like, you know, there are a lot of people who are like really big into it. I'm not, but um, more power to you if you are. I mean, Someone explain it to me. I'm, I'm I mean, explain it to me like I'm five because I really don't understand the appeal. I mean, listen, you know, you get you get a lot of family beef, a lot of family drama. I'm not a diehard fan, but you know, you know the fact that Rey Mysterio's son is back trying to uh, take the family name over. It's a little tough out I mean, here, right? I don't. I see. You know I, I'm I don't it's know okay. the reference. I know not, none not, of Here's the thing. Hold on. Hold on. Here's, here, where's the wrestling extent in? All right, let's, let's go. The Rock. You, we know the Rock, right? Yeah, I know We're, the Rock. Okay, Stone Cold. You know him with his chair. Yeah. Okay, Triple H. Yeah, I know the name. I couldn't point him out, but I know the name. That's tough. I'm not going to lie. That's a that's a breaking point right there. Let's get to halftime. <laughs> Triple H is pretty iconic. <laughs> Sorry. Like, you know, there's a lot there's a lot floating on up in my brain. That's not one of those things I have space for. Were you not a part of the D generation X era? Is that what you're telling me? What is that? Oh, God. Let's move on. So many people are upset right now. That's okay. I'm sorry, That's man. Okay. <laughs> Jonathan Hood, cover your ears. I know. I know. I know. Kill me when I, Hoodie, when I see cover your sorry, ears, buddy. man. Uh, let's get into halftime. Courtney, halftime is my favorite time, especially with you, because you always bring us good nuggets. What do wow. you have for us on halftime today? So I reported last night the Bears are going to do joint practices with the Colts. So they've got their game in Indianapolis, August 19th. It's a Saturday. So I would imagine that the joint practices will be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off day before the game, and then Saturday practice uh, or Saturday game 
in uh, at Lucas Oil Stadium. So those practices will be in Indianapolis. Like you know, the, the ties are natural here. Like Chris yeah. Ballard, Ryan Poles, they work together in Kansas City. They're both GMs of their respective teams. Matt Eberflus was the DC in Indianapolis from 2018 to 21. Natural ties there. There were some. There were some idea last year hey the chiefs are playing at soldier field might the bears do a joint practice ryan poles literally just came from there and Eberflus said last year that he had had like a couple very like preliminary talks about potentially doing that but that wasn't a route they were going to go down but this is the first time i believe since 2021 that they've had joint practices uh with another team the miami dolphins were the last one uh to do a joint practice with the bears so I think it's good. I mean, I think too, you're going up, you're still a young team, a young growing team that's going up against a much more veteran laden team in Indianapolis, but somebody who has a rookie quarterback. So that'll be, I think we're going to be more intrigued to see, Hey, who's playing quarterback. Is it Gardner Minshew getting the ones one reps? Is it Sam Ellinger? Is it Anthony Richardson? Because according to the owner, uh, of the Indianapolis Colts, Jim Mersey, Anthony Richardson starting this year. So let's see what that looks like. But joint practices, as long as you like get like the, you know, the idea out of the way, like we're not like here to like beat the crap out of each other. Like I've, I've covered joint practices where there have been scuffles and you expect that stuff to happen, but you're, it's the preseason. So you got to like tell yourself, okay, it's the preseason. And I would imagine that Flus and, you know, you know, I think that you know, Shane Steichen on, on the indie side will say, have the same sort of idea. Hey, we're not here to like hurt each other. So, um, but it's always good to like go against, see somebody else. I mean, that's the cliche thing. Like when you've been going against your own squad for at that point, it'll probably be three weeks because camp starts at the end of July. Yeah. It'll be good to see somebody else before going into that second preseason game. Here's, here's what I looked at when, when they talked about the joint practice, I was like, oh, there's going to be fights. Like, there's going to be some real fight. Because here's the thing. Flues can preach all he wants that he doesn't want to see them be aggressive and fight. But his principle doesn't speak to that. Because when you're hustling in training camp, you're going to hit somebody really hard. <laughs> yeah. And you just got to be wary of injuries because this yeah. is not the time to injure, like, yourself, other players on your team, or yeah. other teammates, or other players on other teammates teams but we'll see i'm excited to see it's i've covered a few joint practices in my career and you know sometimes they're fun sometimes there's something you can learn i think i just think it's good to see from an earlier stage before you know those preseason games you can only take so much really like but it's good it's good to get a gauge to see where the offensive defensive lines are um because at that point i mean they're wearing pads We'll get a chance to to look and see, you know, what Justin Fields looks like against in a pass rush that's not the Bears. All I ask is just don't do the dumbest thing in all of sports and punch somebody in the helmet. It's the dumbest thing I've don't ever even, seen in my life. There was a <laughs> linebacker for the Vikings who did this against his own teammate. His name was Devontae Downs. He was a yeah. seventh round pick out of Cal. He and this guy, Aviant Collins, who was their swing tackle. It's out of TCU. They something happened. I just remember like being like standing behind the sideline, like uh, the the end zone. I was like, "What the? F- what is that?" Yeah. And Devonte Downs ends up punching Avion Collins in his helmet. I'm like, "This is like the idiots who get mad and punch a brick wall. Like you're not going to win this. I don't care how strong you are, but like you're gonna break your hand. Lo and behold, what happens? He's out there like the next day with a freaking club on his hand. I'm like, God, like don't be a meathead and do that stuff. <laughs> I understand that like testosterone and like you're like you know fighting for a job, but these are people's livelihoods we're talking about. But yeah. don't set your livelihood back by breaking your hand. Yeah, it's, it's the dumbest thing in all of sports. Like, at least if you're going to punch something, you know, go wait till you get in the locker room, punch some drywall. Drywall gives. You know I mean, and also, <laughs> also, before, also but... understand construction, know where the studs are, because wood does not give very well. You got to understand that as well. Uh, let's get it to the third quarter, Courtney, as we keep this thing moving along. Can you tell I'm the guy that punches walls sometimes? I don't punch I, brick walls. I, mean, <laughs> I hope you find where the studs are. I hope you're not like breaking your hand in uh, frustration at the Bulls might not get the number one overall pick tonight. okay all right why you got to bring that negativity here courtney they, they like eight percent but kind of two but so, possibly 1.8 which is more than row well we don't need that negative first off nba here's my plea to y'all real quick before we get into the third quarter we're getting into the third quarter don't send Wimby to houston 
Don't send them somewhere. Like, this is a generational talent. You know where you want them to be. You brought the draft here anyway, the lottery here anyway. Just do it. Just do it. All right, let's get to it. <laughs> let's get into the third quarter. Watch here. Third quarter. As we break down the Carolina Panthers schedule and how that actually can benefit the Chicago Bears. Because I've been somebody who I'm like, I don't see how the Panthers take this huge step back that everybody's thinking. I don't know, you know, what what they what they're expecting to see from the season, but I hadn't actually dug into the Panthers schedule and I thought this would be a great time to do it because at, after doing it, the Panthers might be 1 in 6 by the time they get to their bye week with how I'm looking at this schedule. What are your thoughts on how this Panthers schedule lays out? Is it going to be beneficial for the Bears? Yeah, I went and I looked it up because I was kind of like uh, and I was wondering, all right, the NFC South wide open this year. Yeah. New quarterbacks for the Bucks with Baker Mayfield, obviously Bryce Young with the with the Panthers, Derek Carr with the Saints and then yep. Desmond Ritter, I would assume, uh, yep. unless something changes, is going to be playing, you know, is going to be the quarterback for the Falcons. So they open up before they have a seven week seven bye. They go at Atlanta against New Orleans at home, at Seattle, Minnesota at home, Detroit, Miami. Now, if I look at that stretch, like the first six games, and if they go three and three with a rookie quarterback, like that's Pretty darn good. Um, rookie quarterbacks, by and large. I know that you draft them because you draft on potential, and this guy could be our franchise guy for a very long time. And, you know, some of the early videos that have come out from, you know, rookie mini camp, uh, which we saw for them last week, is like, wow, Bryce Young's really small. Like, look at what an average offensive line looks like. I'm um, not calling the uh, Carolina Panthers offensive line average, but I'm saying, like, look at the size of what an average NFL height. average height. Yeah. And look at Bryce Young. Like, he's tiny. Like, and, and, but, he, but that's – we knew this. Like, we're not going to go over this again. We knew he did was you, small. Did you see the picture of him at the podium? And it's, like, the downward angle, so he looks just above the podium. I'm like, y'all wrong for that. I know. They, <laughs> they did that on purpose. Um, like – Here's what I think, because like I, I, you know, I scanned this before the podcast, and I was like, all right, like nine and eight, like seems to make sense, because the Panthers last year they fought their ass off for Steve Wilkes at the end of the season, like so Matt Rule gets fired, they start siphoning off pieces, they send Christian McCaffrey in the trade to San Francisco, and yet they're one game away, that final game of the season against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, like they were a game away from winning the NFC South. Um, after starting, I believe it was one and six last year. So I think they're a talented team. They've only added pieces uh, since, since, you know, free agency in the draft. And yes, DJ Moore was their number one wide receiver for since 2018. And he's gone now, but Bryce young has good pieces to work with. And and particularly on the defense there, JC Horn, um, Jeremy chin, Brian Burns, like they've got a lot of like, core younger guys that they're going to continue to build around. I thought they had a good draft. So to me, what's most critical there, and I know this is kind of like what we talked about with the Bears schedule with Green Bay, the Atlanta opener is, you know, to me, like because that one's on the road for them. That's the first game for Bryce Young in, uh, you know, in, in an NFL uniform. Like that's crucial because if they don't win that game, they could go, I mean, they could really go one and five in that stretch of the first six games before they have the bye week, which, you know, then coming to Chicago, that would be Houston, Indianapolis, three weeks after the bye. Bears could be in a much better spot than the Carolina Panthers are. And, you know, if you if you're a Bears fan because of where this first round pick could potentially be, you're rooting for all of the struggles that rookie quarterbacks typically deal with for Bryce Young to, to have those sorts of things. So not only can you maybe get a win over them in week nine when they come to Soldier Field for or excuse me, week 10 when they come to Soldier Field for Thursday night football, but that would help your chances of getting a much better draft pick next year. But you know, as I go through this schedule, I mean, Houston, Indy, Chicago, those could, could, in theory, all be wins for the uh, Carolina Panthers coming out of their bye week. And maybe if they do have a rough start, if they're not able to beat, um, you know, if they drop the opener in Atlanta, because that feels like in that first stretch, that's the only like, hey, this kind of feels like a winnable game yeah. because New Orleans has an upgraded quarterback. Seattle still has Geno Smith. Kirk Cousins is the best quarterback in the NFC North. Detroit is a pretty, at least they project on paper to be a pretty good team with a lot of weapons for Jared Goff and a quarterback who threw for 4,000 yards and all these other things. And then Miami, like 
assuming Tua is still, you know, he looks good coming off the concussions and he's back to normal. Like that's a really tough team to beat with a lot of speed on the outside. So it's a tough stretch. So you got to, if you're Carolina, get that win in week one against Atlanta. Yeah, don't let Cordero Patterson run all over you. And oh, that's that, that's a nice one two punch. Actually, I didn't think about that. Cordero and Bijan. Mm-hmm. That's a really nice one two punch there. And the way that they use Cordero, like, you know, yeah, he's, he's anybody, everybody. anybody's guess as to like week to week how they're going to use him. They realistically, I mean, if you think about it and, and maybe Cordero doesn't get enough enough love around the league on it. He's really just like six foot three Gino or uh, Debo. Or, yeah, Debo Samuel. Mm hmm. Like no, they, I mean, hey, they really kickoff, use him like that. They return, lose a lot. Like catching passes, the backfield, running back. Like he does a lot of things for, you know, is any he, team. Is he still on defense play. for special teams? Well, he, he don't you remember the kickoff return he had against the Bears last year? It went for a touchdown. Well, that that's, I remember. I, I remember as a second as a second time I've seen him do that against a team I covered. Like he's really, really good. Like don't kick the ball to him. I think this is just kind of like a like rule of thumb for any special teams coordinator. Do not kick the ball to Cordell Cordero Patterson. Yeah, no, I I think that. But on the Bears, wasn't he on the defense too? Like he was playing on the defense at the same. Because I remember in the Packers game, they called it back. But he was the one that made the tackle that caused it wasn't Christian Watson. I forget who it was, or not Christian Watson. It was I forget who it was that was receiving kickoffs then, but it caused him to fumble the football. And I was like, Cordero Patterson's playing defense too. Like we just like is he Superman? Yeah. Like he's playing high he school football in the is. NFL. <laughs> It's remarkable how they utilize him, but hopefully like, I feel like in Atlanta, cause I thought it actually with the bears until like those sorts of things, like it feels like teams still struggle to figure out how to act accurately use him. Mm-hmm. He's a unicorn. He can do so many things well and his speed will kill you. Yeah. So like how to contain that, like you can only hope to contain it. You could, can't hope to stop it. That's truly what it boils down to. Oh, man. Let's hope that uh, Cordero Patterson runs all over the Carolina Panthers. I do think that that is, like you said, with the Bears, the biggest game that that they're, we're going to see uh, early in that stretch because, I, I, I mean, I, if you get off to a one and five start, you might be looking at what the Bears went through last season where last season where you're able to adjust after the bye. But you're not in a position for you to say, "Okay, we're going to win every one of these games. So, yeah, we'll see how that works out. Speaking of the Carolina Panthers, let's talk about a Panther who currently resides with the Bears. as We get into the fourth quarter. quarter. Courtney, where are you ranking DJ Moore? among the wide receivers in the league right now. Do you feel like he's one of those top dogs? We kind of went through uh, uh, the list a little bit Mm -hmm. and it feels like he kind of settles in around 15, 20. Is DJ Moore a a top wide receiver in this NFL? I think you put him in a perfect spot because the last couple of years, I know like his yards last year were down Uh, Just by his standards, like in 2021, he finished 11th in receiving yards and he's had, you know, three of those 1100 yard seasons. And last year he had a career high seven touchdowns. I think the perfect spot for DJ Moore, like he's not a Justin Jefferson. He's not a Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, AJ Brown, um, you know, even putting like digs in there. But everybody's list outside of the top five, um, you know, from like six to 15 and then and then to 20. I think is subjective. We all know who the best receivers are, like the cream of the crop. These guys are, you know, the hundred million dollar receivers. And then there's like the group beyond that. He's in that group beyond that, but he's absolutely like, if you put him like on par with, uh, you know, I'm just looking through the list right now, like a Devonte Smith, a Terry McLaurin and Amron St. Brown, like Amari Cooper. Like I would put him, you know, very much at the top of the list of those guys. And it's, to me, what the like deciding factor is he's done so much with so many different quarterbacks. Yes. And you know, that's, that's huge. Like that, you cannot understate that, you know, overstate that enough because a lot of that has to do with coaching. I remember talking with Tyke Tolbert about that during rookie mini camp, how, you know, DJ was still able to, able to produce with like eight different quarterbacks throwing in the ball over the course of, you know, his time in Carolina. And sometimes that's coaching saying, Hey, we're going to get the ball to DJ because he can do, you know, he can win his one-on-one matchup. He can win on the outside. He can win wherever you put him. 
And that's a sign of somebody who, no matter the situation, he's not just going to like crumble because things aren't perfect for him. Like he can find a way to win against his guy. And that's important. Now, DJ Moore in this offense is very clearly the number one, very clearly the best pass catching threat for, for Justin Fields. It's how others are going to be able to take like DJ Moore is going to get doubled. Like we know it's going to yeah. happen. That's always what happens when you have really good receivers. Can the other guys take some of the pressure off DJ Moore so he's able to, you know, win those matchups and win them on a consistent basis for Justin Fields? But when you think about, like, where does he rank in these lists? I mean, his numbers have always been consistently good. He's not had a bad season. Like, were, were his yards down because they weren't over 1,000 last year? Statistically, yes, but that doesn't really say much to me outside of the fact that they had Baker Mayfield, they had Sam Darnold, I think P.J. Walker was playing in the game last year. Like, he... There's no consistency. So imagine what happens with, for him when he actually has a quarterback that he knows is going to be not going into a camp with a quarterback competition. He's going in knowing this is the guy. This is the guy who's going to be I can like consistently work with throughout the offseason because I know come July and August, I'm going to be able to pick up right where I left off before they take that time off. And it's important to know for Justin Fields that you are – I mean, it's, a, it's the crux of why they pulled off that number one pick. Uh, the trade for number one pick. They needed to get him a number one receiver, and that was the way to do it. And DJ Moore is very much that. Everybody's list will be subjective. In my list, he's, you know, I put him right there, top 15, top 20. I think it's a perfect spot for him. How much can he move up with that consistent quarterback play this season? How much do you expect him to move up that list? Do you think he kind of stays right there? You know, I, I, if he, top 10, I think, you know, if you, if you have a good season, he could very well fit into the mix of, of guys that you are looking at saying, Hey, like you get him consistency at the quarterback spot. Look how well he can produce. Now yeah. I'm not going to go ahead and guess his yards because the bears had a receiving yeah. room that netted 493 yards from their wide receiver leader last year. And the guy missed the last couple games this season yeah. with an ankle injury. So the floor is very, the bar is very low. But like someone like DJ Moore instantly elevates that group. And that's the reason they brought him here. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting for me. Right. Like I, I it's the point you brought up and, and that I mentioned even on the defensive side. Right. What do the others do to make guys that blue chip piece chase Claypool? I'm looking right at you, bud. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like because it, the, the, the things for me are with Darnell Mooney. My question mark with Darnell is, right, is he going to be the guy that's going to be kept if him and Chase have similar seasons? They're probably going to lean towards Claypool because they've sent the draft capital in him to resign. Right. So who's going to be the guy next season uh, or throughout this season that proves, hey, I'm supposed to be here next season? I'm hoping that competition elevates everything. But realistically, right, you just need somebody else to step up here. I will say I think that Cole Komet being here, Khalil Herbert – and uh, Deontay Foreman, okay, pass catchers out of the backfield. Roshan Johnson, we'll see what he is in the league. Don't but forget I, about Robert Tanyan. That was Robert his role. Tanyan I could, I could, I'm going to say this guy. right here. Like, I think he and Cole are switching roles this year. I think Ooh. Cole's going to be used more as a pr- predominantly more as a blocking tight end. I think that obviously Getze knows what Tanyan can, can do. And yeah. even coming off the ACL, like to me, the bounce back he had – and how seamless it felt like for him last season, the depth, you know, the, the depth per target, the yards per catch, like he is the deep threat that like you might not expect from a tight end, not named Travis Kelsey. So I would imagine just kind of given the way that this thing goes, yeah, I wouldn't, I would not be at all surprised. And I will predict it right here on the show that those two are going to switch roles this year. Ooh. And that you do have a, a, a deep, th- uh, you know, a, a threat at the tight end position that you thought maybe Cole Komet could be, but I just think that that's going to be Robert Tunyon's role and he's going to excel in it really well. So it's not just the receiving core that we're talking about for Justin Fields. It's, it's the, you know, the tight end that they just signed for a bargain and free agency. Could we see a situation here where, right, like maybe the receiver room isn't the room that we're talking about by the end of the season, very much like what the Patriots had, where you're talking about two tight ends who are both your predominant pass catchers outside could of the anymore? It could be. I don't think that that's necessarily, I mean, this offense is predicated on, you know, frequent two tight end usage, but I don't know. Um, 
I, I, you have to get more out of Chase Claypool. You have to get Darnell Mooney back to like put him in the slot, let him thrive. Like yes. I just, I think that there will be, if it works out that way, there will be one predominant tight end pass catcher. I'm not saying that Cole's never going to catch catch a pass again. Of course not. But yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, who's going to be the tight end security blanket in the in the red zone for Justin Fields, the way that Jimmy Graham was a couple years ago? Like that was supposed to be Cole Komet last year. It really wasn't, and. Now, I mean, of course, like about halfway through the season that started to pick up, but then it fell back off again. So can Robert Tunyon be that guy? Is there somebody else who's going to emerge as the red zone threat for field? That those are all the important questions that have to get answered and before we figure out, okay, well, this receiver is, is in this role and he's, you know, this important, this mu- you know, holds this much importance to the offense or it's this tight end or we start using two tight ends. Like all those things matter, but can we ca- carve out who's actually going to be like the, the biggest threat? for Justin Fields inside the 20. Oof, a lot of content there. I like that. We could Eric clip that up. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> as always, man, I, I think we've had a great pod. Courtney, appreciate you for joining us. As oh. always, hit that like button, subscribe to the page. Let us know how you guys feel, man. Courtney dropping the uh, prediction on Robert Tunyon taking a step. That's a big one there. That's a big, if he becomes the number one tight end, we, we will clap it up. We will party harder at the mansion don't worry. I, once we get off here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put the down payment down for it. Perfect. I'm using we some got... of Darnell Wright's money. I'm going to, uh, he, he wants to know it yet, but I'm going to use some of his money. <laughs> yeah. Follow us answer. on everything at ESPN Chicago. Make sure you guys are tuned in with us on the ESPN Chicago app as well. Monday through Friday, you can hear Bears talk right here on the Chicago Bears podcast for Courtney Cronin. It's your boy, Path the Designer, back at it again. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Bird die. Peace.